Welcome to Club Soda's Mindful Drinking Festival. We're online, global, and as always, absolutely free. Hi, I'm Drew, and I'm one of the co-founders of Club Soda. And I'm Laura, the other co-founder of Club Soda. We help you change your drinking in ways that help you live well. So whether you're looking to cut down, stop for a bit or quit, you can find what you need from podcasts and books and courses on joinclubsoda.com. This festival, we've brought you an amazing lineup from over 100 people from across the world. And our programme this time really is global. Every day starts Down Under with me, Sarah. As well as organising the festival in Australia, I spend my time looking for alcohol-free alternatives and tips for people who choose not to drink, but who still want to live a social, fun and adventurous life. And I'll be wrapping up each day here in the States. I'm Amanda, your US festival host and coordinator. And I'm also a mindset coach who helps women change their relationship with alcohol so that they can start living their most authentic life. Each day with a rolling program of inspirational panels, conversations, social events, and opportunities to discover new low and low alcohol drinks. So whether you want inspiration to change your drinking or to connect with other people, or you want to discover and enjoy a new low and no alcohol drink. The Mindful Drinking Festival is for you. Cheers. 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 Hi, everybody. Lauren here from We Love Licit, alcohol-free adventure holidays. We're joined today by our guest all the way from the United States. This is Wes Gear. Uh, Wes is a guitarist. Uh, producer and entrepreneur. Now, for those of you who don't know, Wes started off playing as guitarist for his band, Head P.E., uh, who he toured with um, Slipknot, Deftones. Then Wes got sober in 2007 and got a gig touring as touring guitarist with the band Korn. So since leaving Korn, Wes has started up his non-profit called Rock to Recovery and his uh, new band called Human. So we've got quite a lot to talk about today, Wes. Uh, thanks so for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, let me just point out that it's morning here and <laughs> not there. I know it's 9 a.m. Where are you? Is it California? I'm in California. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was up late in the studio, so if you're wondering why I look like this, that's why. That's my excuse, and I'm going with it. <laughs> you look good. Uh, so you. what have you been up to? Oh, thanks. How um, are things? Well, I mean, we're all in this world of reaction right now to the ever-changing uh, playing field we're on. But, uh, I mean, to keep it topical, the same tools that have you know, transform my life away from the typical um, band guy touring, doing copious amounts of mind altering chemicals and substances and alcohol and such. Uh, those same tools apply now is to be, you know, malleable and, and uh, be able to flow and stay in a good space spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not let it get to you really. Yeah. Hopefully um, in theory, that's the, that's the goal. Yeah, no, totally. So, Wes, I've been following you for quite a while on Instagram, and I thought you had quite an interesting story. Uh, I thought it'd be really good to get you on here because uh, you, you know, from a bit of a different background, you were, you know, you've been in rock bands, music industry all your life. Um, yeah, so just to bring something different. Um, so I've been doing a little, well, reading about you, and I know that uh, we go back a little bit you started getting into I suppose it was around school time you got into the kind of stoner scene and uh, it all sort of went from there isn't that right that's that uh, that's totally correct but I think I think we got to talk about uh well uh, causes and conditions you know yeah. um some people maybe just experience experiment and they're dipping their toes in the water what I found for me uh where I turned into being an addicted person, you know, to all sorts of addictions. Uh, I really had to get down the cause of the conditions. So that marijuana wasn't just like, oh, I'll smoke a little of my friends and experiment. It was like me trying to escape. I was trying to escape how I felt. And, and that's really where it all started. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot of people that would experiment and, you know, they don't go down the same path. Uh, definitely school was right. really instrumental for me as well. I kind of, I never really felt that I, you know, fit it in. And I got into the alternative music scene and it was kind of an outlet and somewhere you could, you sort of feel, um, felt like you belonged. Would you say that in the alternative music scene, there's more instances of sort of alcohol and drug misuse in general? 
You know, I've thought about these kind of things that, I mean, yeah, I, I think there's this part of the world who expects anybody who looks like Robert Smith from The Cure or something like that to, those are the ones doing the most heroin, but man, or whatever, drinking, it's everywhere. You know, the, you know, the jocks as they call them when we were younger, you know, they're, they're drinking a lot. And the, the, you know, the people at the nice uh, universities, the college culture drinks a lot. Um, I think it's everywhere. If you're, if you're in tune with that's where you want to go, that you'll find it, you know what I mean? And uh, I think there's exceptions everywhere. You know, stock brokers, people in high finance, let's go drink some whiskey. Maybe what they put in their body costs a little more money. Yeah. But I think it's everywhere. But I think what's relevant to my story is where addiction is a progressive disease. It gets worse over time. And we know that that's a fact of how it works. The thing that happens with music is there's a lot of people out there and maybe people watching right now who have the potential to become alcoholics or their addiction can get really bad if they have the opportunity to cultivate it. So I kind of had, I was working a corporate job. I did corporate for years wearing the tie and my long hair and a ponytail. And, uh, and that curtailed my use to a certain degree where I was only weekend warrior. When the weekends came, it was pitchers of beer and lots of tequila. And I wasn't doing drugs. And I, I even quit smoking cigarettes, uh, fags as it were. And uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if I can get in trouble with that today, probably. But anyhow. No, it's a UK <laughs> well, term. Well, in, 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 yeah, in America, <laughs> um, we're talking about cigarettes. But, but what happened was um, I started experimenting with some heavier substances and then I got my record deal. And so I even heard this little quiet voice deep down inside of me that was almost inaudible, but it was kind of like, now you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so I, I didn't have to get up for work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then I knew, and I had that freedom. And then you go out in the road and then um, not only do you have the space to let your addiction be cultivated, but even maybe on a night where you might go, no, I'm not drinking tonight. Then your buddies at the show or somebody, you know, in Minnesota and they're like, here and it's just like so you're in a situation where you could say no for a couple hours but at 10 o'clock at night you might say yes so it just there's many factors which lend itself to um really growing the beast if you will yeah totally i think the environment is a huge one especially you know in your mm -hmm. background and i know you you've talked about before. So you basically, you start, you know, getting, getting on the drugs and then you, uh, you got really successful and you talked about before how it doesn't necessarily equate to, you know, you can be successful and also have addiction problems. Well, well successful this to a is certain the extent. big, no, I, well, here's the, th here's the thing. Success has nothing to do with it. Look at all the dead rock stars. Look at all the yeah. dead models, all the dead actors. They're, they're, they're everywhere. This, this, that's success is a facade that the addict likes to wear to make themselves feel okay. And so at the height of my addiction, I had all these crappy bands. I was very much a leader, uh, the leader of my band and the direction and the sound and the, like, you know, the business you know, everything we were doing. Um, and I was also at the height of my addiction. So for me, I was like, I actually was like, well, this stuff is great. Clearly it's what I'm doing and putting in my body. That's giving me this magic. And I think that for, there's kind of two parts of it here. I think that a lot of people do that. Like, well, I'm a busy mother and I have three kids and I'm taking online classes and you know what, this wine is just without this wine, I can't get by. And for a lot of people, that's true. Or I have childhood trauma or I'm going through a lot in my life and I need to drink or use a little drugs or smoke or whatever to take the edge off. And there's probably a strong argument that uh, on some level that keeps people alive or functional for a while. The problem is it's not a long term solution. So, you know, we keep telling ourselves we're OK because, hey, look at my bank account or look at this or look at that. or, um, But that's just... <laughs> You know, you can be killing yourself at the same time, and we see it happen all the time. Actually, I had people reach out to me because I knew Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park um, for a long time, and they would be like, I just don't get it. How could you do that? And, and I'm not going to say I know all the circumstances behind his death because I don't. But the question that came at me was, 
how could you do that when you have everything? And it's like, well, everything is money wise? and success and success. What if you're, if you're miserable inside and you have everything, money, success, wife, and you're still miserable and dark and you're trapped and you're mm -hmm. addicted to whatever gambling, sex, drugs, alcohol, there's lots of addictions. If you have all these things that are supposed to give you a good life and you're still miserable, how much worse is that than somebody who's like, my life has been a complete shit show forever. I have bad family. I barely have a car, blah, blah, blah. I'm an addict. Then at least you're thinking, well, maybe if I get all these things, it can make my life better. But yeah, it's, it's an inside job. That's what I'm getting at. It's really this. It's yeah. our spirit. It's our energy and what we can do to cultivate that so we don't have to look outside of ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Because as long as we're searching outside of ourselves to make our, ourselves feel better, well, we're always a victim to circumstance, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It, you sort of justify it, like you said, as well for, you know, for a lot of people, only you can only do that for so long and then get to the point where, you know, you have, have to stop telling stories to yourself. Um, speaking about uh, whenever you did tour and perform, uh, whenever you were on on the drugs and booze, how how was that actually sustainable? That's well, what I want body, to know. <laughs> your body's quite resilient, and we used to joke about it too. Is uh, that you go out you're, for the people who are heavy drinkers or whatever? You go out in the first you know few nights of tour, you're hurting, you got a hangover, but your body learns how to operate on that level. You know, it's very quick and resilient, and. I mean, a horrible analogy. You go to the gym once and you're like super sore. You hit the gym every day and, and it's like you, yeah. you get used to operating that way. Your body is very adaptive and very, very resilient. And I was blessed slash cursed where um, I didn't get hangovers too often. I mean, I definitely had way too many of them that were just like I wanted to die hangovers. But the majority of the nights I would wake up still kind of drunk from the night before and be like, yeah, all right. And then I'd sober up and here we go again. Yeah, totally. And uh, what about uh, everybody kind of imagines that all sort of rock stars, everyone in the bands are sort of caning it all the time. Is that the reality? Are there people that get no. an early night? Do people yeah, moderate? So my first band head, we, all kind of had grew up with the men mentality, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, looking at our idols. And then I, we, I know I was, I think the other guys would be too, uh, kind of almost confused when we compared notes because we did tour, with, let's say Lincoln park when they were a baby band and, you know, go all drunk over to their tour bus. And you're like, what are you guys doing? That's probably <laughs> why they got so successful. And we did it quite honestly. And I'm, I'm joking and extremely serious at the same time. Um, everybody didn't do that. And, uh, but the, you know, like, it's like what we were talking about uh, earlier is that, yeah, there is that part that if you're looking for it, everybody's doing it, but there's also the other part if you're looking for it. And that's what I found in sobriety. I remember being on Ozfest and my bass player who, and this is back in the late nineties would do tons of yoga. Me, the Ozfest was like, I have no choice. I have to drink all day, every day. That's just what's going to happen here. I can't sit in the tour bus. It was just too boring. Um, but it was a singer, Surge from System of a Down, and Mark, my bass player, just sitting out in the sun, chatting. Just chilling and out. I was like, oh, my God, look at what you guys are doing. I, I go, I want to be like you. And they go, come on. I remember this really well. They go, come on, sit with us, hang with us. And I was like, I can't. I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go drink. I gotta go use. So, you know, uh, again, it's, it's, it's what you can find whatever you're looking for. Yeah. I think it's really important for people to hear that because so often, especially in the sort of alternative music scenes, people tend to identify with this kind of don't give a shit, don't give a fuck. You have to get completely wasted and all the time, uh, all the time. So well, I think you it's really not give a shit and not give a fuck and be sober. That's yeah. the key. Yeah, to be exactly. able to be punk rock and sober and be an artist and sober. And then you find out the thing. The other thing too, is that, uh, sorry, I totally interrupted you. No, the go thing ahead. Too is sobriety is prevalent now um, in the nineties. And if you go back even farther, like 
people didn't talk about addiction. Like there wasn't, you know, we love lucid and all these things and rock recovery and a million organizations. Everybody talking about addiction. We've all been uh, touched by it in some way. We've lost people to it. We see people it used to be, you didn't talk about it. Like, Oh, don't talk about, you know, aunt Sally, Sally, she has a real bad drinking problem and people just blocked it out. Now it's like, you should go to rehab. <laughs> so mm-hmm. We're in a beautiful time now where my point is that if you go out on the road or if you go out in the music scene, there's sober coalitions everywhere. Um, there's there's like sober uh, tents at Coachella, and, and I'm sure many of the festivals in Europe, it's been a minute since I've been there. And uh, there's also at Burning Man, oh, right? Yeah. And, okay, so Burning Man, for those people who don't know, it's like a giant city that gets built in the desert what's uh what's the word it's just a barter system everybody brings and yeah. barters and everybody's half naked and you think you they're all on ex- i haven't been yet so i gotta go Not yet. me neither me neither yeah i know i haven't but listen my life was burning man for decades <laughs> i must say but i do need to go um i didn't want to go because i got sober and then but now to my point is there's a whole sober uh neighborhood i guess is the best yeah. word for it at burning man so the power of sobriety is out there if you want to look for it. Yeah, totally. No, it's definitely growing. It's quite, uh, it's really huge here as well, getting really big, the movement in the UK. It's funny you were talking about Burning Man. I was thinking about that earlier on. I'm kind of dying to go to a, I'm dying to go raving or just go to a festival as a sober person. I just haven't done that since I quit. I quit almost about four years ago and uh, I'm heading to Berlin in September and I'm, I might just go to a nightclub by myself and go go raving and yeah. I don't know Do it. yeah Do it. I know just for the experience I mean I would I wouldn't have fun unless I had I shouldn't say that um I prefer to have other sober people with me and if anybody's listening I think the mid- mistake a lot of people make is trying to live the exact same life just not drinking and for yeah. some they can do that um you know, but some people can't, you know, some people, it's like they say, if you hang out at the, at the barbershop all the time, you're going to get a haircut. So (laughs) the idea is, is, um, if you got to make changes in your life to change your course and how your relationship is to drinking alcohol, maybe don't go to the clubs you've been going to all the time. Having said that, somebody like you or myself, where you have good recovery or good, like you feel powerful and strong, then it is about getting out there and experimenting. And I remember going to bars when I had a couple of years sober because I it was I did change my entire life, but you know it doesn't happen overnight. So I'd sometimes go into a bar that I would used to day drink at and get a Red Bull and smoke a cigarette back where I smoked, just because I wanted to see the girls. And I, yeah. you know, being a single guy, I wanted to go in. Okay, and then in <laughs> time, I was like, I was like, okay, I can hang here, but these people are buzzed. We're not on the same. Yeah vibe and yeah. that's really what was off putting about it you know hey blah, 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 like okay. <laughs> and, you know or if you or if you do meet a girl and she's like hey oh. hey that's a <laughs> it's like know. you know like it kind of it kind of walks you out of there but you know that's a bar and people go to bars to drink but if you're going to a concert or event or a rave and you want to dance or experience just people getting out into their body yeah then i say try it and see if you like it yeah i think i will i've got a friend uh, i've got a couple of sober friends over there actually who might be up for it but i'm really glad you brought that up about uh, you know whenever you quit drinking some people they do you see it on a lot of the groups they'll say oh i've quit but my life sucks um and you sort of say well have you have you been doing anything different have you tried anything new are you connecting with other sober people and i would say that's like one of the it's definitely up there amongst the top things that you need to prioritize whenever you quit um for in your in your case what did you get into did you start any new hobbies or take anything else up yeah well to comment on something i quit and my life sucks if somebody's being that dramatic they probably have some deeper issues one thing mm-hmm. I learned now, let's be very clear. I, I was an alcoholic and I, I'm a member of a 12 step program. When I read the book, I, I, it explained to me stuff I didn't realize about myself that was a, a, absolutely true. When I drink, I have a reaction to booze that makes me crave it. I want more, more, more. It goes all, all, and other people don't have that. 
But what goes with that is when I don't drink, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. So when people say I'm bored or my life sucks when I don't drink, I would say it's probably not boredom. You probably got some emotional issues that you are running from because if you're an adult and you don't have to do anything and you get to sit in the couch and relax, that should be awesome. Yeah. So if sitting with yourself and not doing anything is uncomfortable and you're li- and you feel like your life sucks because you're not inebriated, then you might have a deeper <laughs> emotional issue to tend to. Um, one of the things I thought about when I got sober and I was looking about what I could do, what I wanted to do, what I want to do, what, what what I should do, my new life, I was th- I came up with this kind of concept. If I have to, if it's not fun be- because I'm not drinking, then it's probably not fun. Because I used to get wasted everywhere I went. And if I went to an amusement park, I took acid or whatever. But wait, amusement parks are still fun when you're not on acid. Sitting at a bar is not really that fun with a bunch of drunk people. Okay, yeah, because you're sitting in a room with a bunch of drunks. That's not that fun. But you have a whole friggin' world of skydiving, river rafting, hiking. And so to answer your question, yeah, I got into the gym. I decided I wanted to get into running. I've become a runner, and I love mm. that. I got into hiking. I got deeper into my music. I became um, kind of a workaholic because I love my work. And so I get such joy from creating. And that's how Rock to Recovery came to be. Mm-hmm. So um, the space that was created for me, I took it as a personal challenge of like, um, all right, all those hours you spent drinking or being drunk or hungover or unproductive because you thought you were amazing doing something, but you were... <laughs> You know, <laughs> trying to create when you're drunk. I, I took it as an opportunity to really create. And um, one thing that I'll say that I also kind of figured out for myself is, and I would challenge anybody with this who thinks that that they should uh, that they should limit their drinking or whatever. If you feel like you should drink less, like it's making you less healthy or less attractive or fatter or more hungover or you're wasting money, all these things. I do believe in a spirit of the universe, a God, if you will. I don't believe that God would punish you and give you a shitty life for removing something that's bad for you. You know what I mean? Like, so for me, I was like, I'm killing myself with this drinking and drug and stuff. Um, And then when I first stopped doing it, I didn't like how I felt so much, but I would just think, well, clearly if that's what I got to do to not die, I'm not set, sentenced to lo- to have a shitty life without drugs and booze. I just will not believe that. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard you talk about that before. And it's funny how your mindset changes from, you know, when you start to consider taking alcohol or drugs out of the equation, you really do think that life is going to suck. You you just can't imagine it. And then when you actually get into it, it you just realize how, how actually amazing it is. And I suppose, you know, the likes of, sober people and Instagram and likes of yourself and myself that we're trying to show that to people, you know, trying to show them that there is another way to live. But for a lot of people, it's really just about living that experience themselves. You know, I know myself, I probably wouldn't believed it anyway at the time if somebody had told me that, you know, I wouldn't have had conversations with people that didn't drink for a start. Uh, I just wouldn't have entertained such a thing. But um, I just wanted to touch, uh, touch on your time with corn. So you got that gig. Can I interject something on that last point? Fast before we move to that. I had the same thought. My life is going to suck. Yeah. So let's go back just to think. I have this thing that's killing me. It's ruining my life. It's questionable in many ways. And I don't want to let it go. That's kind of insane. And I think letting it go is going to give me a life that sucks. Well, have you lived that life of sobriety and given it some time? No, I have not. So I've called contempt prior to investigation. And, yeah. and it's insane. And I think that comes part and parcel to addiction which is we say what the future is going to be like with actually no evidence. So yeah. don't believe the lies. I, I share this a lot. Just don't believe the lies that your head tells you. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Um, yeah. So you got the gig with corn because actually you were sober because yeah. head was, he, he was out of corn for a little while. Wasn't he? About Brian seven Welch. years. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Seven years. He's sober now too, isn't he? I believe he's sober. He did. He found, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if he's 100% abstinent. I would guess that he is. Uh, yeah. But I know he, uh, 
he found his recovery through his spirituality and transformed his life. And I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think he drinks or does anything anymore, honestly. And so for you, how did it compare touring and performing uh, completely sober to before when you were on a mission to, well, before you got sober? Well, people used to ask me when I played with head and like you said, we were playing, you know, out playing with corn in their heyday and system of down slipknot and incubus and, you know, all, all these bands. So we were doing some good shows. They used to ask me, uh, do you get <laughs> stage fright? And I'd be like, no, I don't get stage fright. Well, yeah, of course I don't because I have, uh, I have a drink before we play, which is this big and it's Jack Daniels and, um, which was probably about five drinks in one. We had a rule in our band that you couldn't start drinking uh, until an hour before showtime because we mm. realized very quickly that if we started more than an hour, <laughs> we'd be too messed up. <laughs> Nightmare. Um, so, so then when I got out with Corn, now Head was like, you know, it was all of our band, but it was like my band and I was very much a leader role. And, you know, what are they going to do? Kick me out if I have a bad performance? So I had the booze and then I had, uh, you know, I was a founding member of that band. So then you get in <laughs> playing with corn. I have no booze. And I figured out very quickly about the stage fright or just, you know, tons of nerves and anxiety of going to play shows that were much bigger on a consistent mm. <laughs> level. We, we went into all the head would play like, you know, uh, Oh, I don't know. You know, we played Milton Keynes, right. Uh, Ozfest with black Sabbath. Then we played at probably two or 3 PM of the day. And with corn, we go back to those same, festivals and we're playing at 10 11 at night headlining and the other part was like i was a hired gun it wasn't my band so i was paid to play really well and i'm not a studio guitar player like one of those guys who plays perfectly i'm a very much a rock guitar player that plays by feel and uh um i'm not like a trained musician so i'm very imperfect um it's hard to explain, but you know, my, my, my strength isn't being like spot on perfect, like do, 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 like a machine precision. Yeah. I'm more of a field player, but uh, mm -hmm. so I had that. And then, and then we're playing these giant shows and I was super nervous. And then, you know, I would go out and start songs. Then I just, I just remember my heart beating out of my chest it was, and it was really difficult, but um, you know, I had to learn to make peace with it. And you can apply that to anything. Like anybody listening, there's all these things that you're like, well, I couldn't do this without drinking, or I couldn't make love without drinking, or I couldn't go on a date or whatever. Um, you can. And when we use it as a crutch, we're staying weak. You know, it's like if you have to go up a flight of stairs and every time you do, somebody carries you up the stairs, well, you're going to, you're never going to gain the ability to walk up the stairs on your own. However, first time you do it hurts a little bit and if every day you're running up those stairs you get strength in your legs and it's like what it's nothing to me now and so by taking those you know that stage fright and that um anxiety and fear head on what happened was i became a better player than i had ever been and uh another thing that i think is true not only in music but a lot of life is like you realize when you're out there and you're feeling so good all buzzed then you're actually sloppy and the stuff that you think you're doing so much better isn't that you're doing it better because you're drunk. It's because you're drunk. You don't notice how sloppy you're doing it. And you just don't care. So with head, I was playing sloppy and having the night of my life and, you know, and with corn, I learned how to become a precision player and, mm -hmm. and be really tight and hit a whole new level of, uh, of abilities. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's a good point. It's a uh, part of the whole growth, isn't it? That, you sort of go through whenever you quit. It's just quitting's kind of the first step, and then you have to push yourself through all these boundaries. And for yeah. you, it was you know becoming a better guitarist. And um, so, yeah. What one question about the the whole social side of things? Whenever you started touring with Corn, did you go to the same parties that you might have had, went to before? Was that a bit sort of how was it different in any way? The side, the party side of the the touring and being well, in that scene. The interesting thing is that it's funny how the universe responds to you in such unexpected ways to meet your needs. So I thought I would be out of music because I'm, you know, 
I have to be sober and I left my band and I'm now I'm too old and you can't be in music and be sober. Again, all those lies. My brain had it figured out based on sound logic. Clearly I'm too old and I won't find a band and you can't be sober. Da, da, da. <laughs> and then what happened with Korn, they, they weren't all 100% sober, but they were over the party scene. They'd settled down. It wasn't a ha about having a bunch of trollops backstage and drunken <laughs> debauchery anymore. I, I don't even, my mom uses that <laughs> word. I just, just thought I'd throw it in. Um, I like that. Um, it was, I mean, like it was, it, it was clamped down. You know, they didn't want to be frank. They didn't want their wives to have to worry about a bunch of chicks hanging out and, and all that stuff. Um, so I was met with that, but, but also by the time I got the corn gig, I had gotten sober in Oh four and made it to almost three years, picked up again, crashed and burned after six months. And then in seven, I got sober again. So by the time I got, cor got the corn gig, I was almost three years sober again. So I had, the point is I had a long time, a few years mm. to learn how to live sober. And so you know, it becomes a lot of changing the day, uh, sorry, the night for the day. So, you know, yeah. getting to bed early, not eating too much pizza, yeah. not looking for the party, and then yeah. getting up and enjoying, oh, I'm in whatever city. Let me get up and go do a jog through the city. And then what mm -hmm. happened is the morning became the high. Yeah. You know? so, um, so I guess the answer is, no, I didn't go to the same parties. I mean, I remember... Rammstein came out to see us um, in Germany and everybody was hang, hanging out. And I hung out for a while, um, you know, but uh, I think the difference is when, when I'm drinking and I think for a lot of people, you go to a party and you're there five hours and cool for me now and drinking, if I wanted to dip into a party and say hi to some people, I'll go in, have some great conversations, get a strong hour in. Now, if you think about it, when you're drinking, what happens after an hour or two? You're sloppy. You probably had the bang that you're trying to get of connecting with people. And after that, it's just a slop fest. So I feel <laughs> like I would get the the part where, you know, the exciting part, a few good connections and conversations and get get home to the to the to the hotel. Yeah. No, I can totally relate to that. I know some people that they they go out still and you know they'll still stay out all night but I can relate to you I, I definitely I go out for a little bit and um mainly because I also love to go up in the morning and do stuff and because I don't really like sitting chatting to people when they're off their face but um Wes there's people have got a few <laughs> questions here but uh first of all I I really wanted to chat to you about uh your project your new project so you've got Rock to Recovery which is a non-profit is that right yes is that uh it's it? a non-profit Technically, we have both entities. It started as a nonprofit, but then I have a, a, a for-profit segment of business because a lot of people purchase our services that are also for-profit businesses. But it started out as a nonprofit, the idea to bring the transformative therapeutic elements of playing music to mm -hmm. non-musicians. Uh, and so basically I figured out a way where I could take 10 people who've never touched an instrument in their life. And by the end of an hour, we will find a place where we connect emotionally on a deep level and put that into a song and write it, perform it together as a group and record it in the end of an hour or so, or however long the session lasts. Mm. And what, what has the outcome been? Uh, in which sense, as far as growth or as far as the, yeah, like how clinical? Do people react? to it and how does it help them so it's uh, for people who are in recovery isn't that right mainly and veterans as well that's how that's how it started yeah and you know the reality is everybody's in recovery of some sort you know <laughs> yeah. we're, we're all uh, everything we're talking about about growth it's all about recovering who and what you truly are getting out of doubt getting out of self-esteem issues getting out of heartbreak processing emotions yeah. That's the journey for every human. Even if you're the most successful, never touched a drink or drug your whole life, you still got something that a new level that you can crack to by processing some feelings. But the outcomes are, um, you know, when you go into a treatment center, we're really in in the realm of a lot of really uh, groundbreaking elements of um, expressive. Uh, Experiential, excuse me, experiential um, groups and such. You know, they have equine therapy and yoga mm -hmm. and hiking and surfing, all these experiential groups. And, you know, 
the world of addiction has really been battling addiction has really been a long journey. So they realized, you know, you got to talk about your feelings and your traumas or your challenges and your emotional issues. Great. So if you figure that that has been a very important staple of addiction for a long time, and they start ex doing some experiential thing, uh, treatments. If you figure there's a guy who might be in rehab or a veteran and they're talking about their emotions and they're dark and they might do some yoga, okay, great. But where is there a place where you show them to express, mm -hmm. to challenge themselves and emote? So if you can imagine what somebody goes through in a curriculum, as I just explained, a few spots they might hit in a treatment program, and then what we do is we come in and we'll, we'll connect on that level of like, hey, I'm an addict like you. I've been through a lot of stuff. So that's a very important part of recovery. Then we share in some emotional topic that we have that's real for the time, like dealing with the loss of a loved one or whatever you're going through. It could be anything. Use those as the lyrics. We show them how to write a song. Now, in therapy, you know, it's one thing we can admit something to ourselves. Like, I really admitted to myself this is a problem. That has a certain uh, um, effect. But then when we admit it to ourselves, or let's say we're writing affirmations and we get it on paper, or we've got to write a letter to that ex that hurt us or that, uh, you know, whatever we writing on paper is also therapeutic. So we have that element in rock to recovery. But then what we also do is we connect as a group where, which is, you know, they say the opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah. That's really what we're craving. We're craving mm -hmm. connection. So we're working as a group on this common purpose but then we get in our body and we start playing music. So what happens when you listen to music, which we all agree is quite, quite magical and transformative, that's engaging half your brain. When you play music, that engages your whole brain, it's emotional, it's motor function, and it mm -hmm. helps create new neural pathways. So it creates new positive experiences. And so what I did this Zoom session yesterday with just one guy, it's this doctor, and for example, we wrote affirmations. It was very simple. I feel happy when I, and then we would put in, go to the beach. I feel happy when I procrastinate. And we sang and we started playing guitar and now we're dancing and we're in our bodies and you start feeling it and you feel the happiness. And when your body has the experience of feeling happiness, it creates these new experiences. And what it does is you have this crusty layer of hurt and damage and pain and you're cracking it open. And you're showing people that like, because when you put it this way, when you go into treatment, you're not stoked. You don't go, I'm having a, I'm smashing it out there. Let me go to treatment. You're going in broken, hurt, addicted, whatever, right? Or, or we, we, we also tie this into um, transformative uh, retreats that we do where people are trying to crack through new le levels. But when you start singing these mantras, Right. We talked about putting on paper and they can be frivolous. They can be we can write a song about pizza, but usually they tend to be very profound to what mm. somebody's experiencing it. And then when we get to the course of the song, the hook, if you will, we sing that what the mantra of what we want to be or the tools we're going to use to crack the new levels in life. So if you can imagine a treatment center with a lot of doom and gloom and darkness and processing and hurt and pain, we get people in their body. And by the yeah. end, they're singing like, I'm not drinking anymore. Whatever the lyric is, we yeah. write. It's super powerful. Mm. And then they, that sticks with them. They can take that into their day, that energy. Um, so what I would ask, I will, I'll give you a little story too. Just be, just be careful of time. Sorry, Wes. I really want you to be able to talk about your band too. So No problem. We'll go till when? Uh, we, when we've we already got a few minutes left. <laughs> okay. So I'll just tell you a quick story. A guy comes yeah, in me. dope sick. He wants to die. He's suicidal. He can't sleep. He can't eat. He's defecating himself. That's typical dope sickness. We had him just play a little shaker. He was like, well, how is this going to help me? By the end of the group, he was transformed and like was super believing in his life now. And wow. so what my point is, what drug does that mm. in what in one hour transforms you into being elated and hopeful? It's amazing. Yeah. Um. Yeah, sorry to 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 cut That's you off okay. there when you're talking about that. But uh, yeah, I wanted to hear just before we go, also a couple of questions about your band, Human. Tell yeah, us a little glad. bit about this. It's more of an indie vibe, isn't it? Well, it's brand new, and so yeah, we're definitely indie. Um, we're collaborating with some really successful, high-level musicians. I can't put the name out there yet, but it's Clinton, 
who's a dear friend and he plays in the legendary punk band di myself obviously um i can't tell you who else and then we found this singer cat matt who i he actually works for rock to recovery i met him because he was was doing music sessions with us and i was like this voice um and we're doing music i don't you know any time a musician tells you what their band sounds like and i'm sure everybody's experienced this you're like listen you're like no you don't but people have told us we sound like muse radiohead massive attack I was, and stuff about like that. Say, I was about to say muse radiohead and a little bit of manson in there there's a little bit of yeah there was a one of our songs had a little bit of like he goes in that deep voice that creepy manson vibe so we're kind of yeah. all over it's a little electronic it's a little rock it's a little bit sexy um yeah yeah it's h u three it's like hue like the color right hue and then men like plural uh but it's the e's are three so h u three oh there it is on the bottom of the screen m three n uh follow us oh, on there Instagram you go h u three m three n oh what did you say follow us on instagram for a chance to win 10 million pounds <laughs> there's a chance it's a very small small <sighs> chance but if I you follow us on Instagram, you just might win. I'm going to steal that for that for my business. Yeah. Um, right. Let me quickly have a look and see. I'm not sure there's any. Okay. Is marijuana more acceptable in your circles than hard drugs or even booze? Somebody's asked. Nicole has asked. Okay. So for me, I have to stay totally sober because if I do anything, it leads me back. It always leads me back. That's the, the way my addiction slash alcoholism works. Um, having said that, I think if there's one thing God put on the planet that was like, here, you guys kind of need some, I would say it would be uh, marijuana over booze. People don't yeah. smoke weed and get in fights or smoke weed and wake up and go, who are you? And what did we do last night? Um, but I think you also have to look at how prevalent marijuana is and how potent it's become. And um, I think really the thing is, if you're questioning if it's okay, that's kind of fun because if you don't have a problem, you're probably not questioning anything. So the, the thing is, is it controlling you? Is it like in your life more than you want it to be? Can you put it down and walk away easily? And if not, you might want to look at that. Um, that's really the, the bar, I think. Yeah, good point, Wes. Um, I agree with you. Um, all right, we have run out of time. Wes, can you tell everybody where they can find out information about you, Rock to Recovery and Human? Um, yeah, I have it right here on the screen. Yes, Angela Sonic, I did play with Papa Roach. Uh, let's see. I I have my name's on the screen at West Gear. That's Instagram. Um, that's probably the best way you can DM me. I'm on uh, the Facebook too as Wesley Gear. Um, I'm not that hard to find if you really want to find me. Really, just Google. It's true. You're you're there. Um. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, thanks very much. It's been great. Yeah. I had a okay, fun chat so with you. Early for us. All right. Yeah. I'm going back into the music studio now. Awesome. Okay. All right, Wes. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye.